do 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 anything you want, man. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast, the 3 a.m. edition here in Australia. That's not to make my guests feel bad at all. It's to make me feel like hyped <laughs> because I don't do many interviews at 3 a.m. in the morning, believe you me. His name is Constantine Kisson. Now, I am very excited to have him on here because he is one of my favorite, I guess you could say, interviewers. He's very intelligent, very witty as well, and he asks some great questions to all the guests on his show Trigonometry is uh, one part of that uh, that interview style. He's got another guest, another, another sorry host on there as well, which you can go guys go check out. He's got some of uh, the most incredible interviews I have had the pleasure of being able to sit through. Uh, he's got some great guests like Jordan Peterson, for example, Helen Joyce, Kevin Dutton, and many many others, which I I highly encourage you guys to go and check out. But Constantine is a Russian-British comedian, podcaster, writer, and social commentator. He made international headlines all the way back in 2018. I'm not sure if you remember this, Constantine, <laughs> but uh, by refusing to sign a university behavioral agreement form, uh, which banned jokes about religion, atheism, and insisted that all human must be respectful and kind. And he recently made international headlines again, a few months ago now, with his uh, work culture has gone too far, the Oxford Uni- Union Address, which is a powerful speech. And again, I encourage everyone to go and look it up. Constantine, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Thanks for having me, man. And I do feel bad about you staying up or getting up at 3 a.m. to talk to me. Although, to be fair, uh, in the past, when we've had certain Australian guests on remotely, we've done that as well. So uh, I know how you feel like you're excited to talk to somebody. Uh, you will get up and do it at any time. Uh, so now I appreciate you reaching out and looking forward to chatting. Likewise, man. What I said before, uh, I meant it because I don't really normally do interviews at 3 a.m. in the morning, but I couldn't say... Like we, we, it, once we had a time, I was like, yes, hundred percent. We're, we're going to make this happen no matter what time it is. Cause yeah, I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. And, and I guess my first question for you is how you, how have you been feeling regarding all the, the explosion regarding the, the address that you gave at Oxford Union Pre, uh, Oxford Union uh, address? Sorry. <laughs> it, it's awesome, man. Um, it, it's look. You can always find negatives and things if you want, and I can give you a couple that have come out of it as well. But broadly speaking, absolutely awesome. Uh, our YouTube channel, when we sat down at the beginning of the year to look at the year ahead, look at our numbers, what, what, what sort of, you know, you, we obviously have big ambitious plans, but there's also realism and you're, you're trying to base it off past performance and so on and so forth. And we looked at it and we went, well, if we get to 500,000 subscribers by the end of the year, we probably won't, but that would be a good result. And here we are. It's the 13th of March and we hit it a couple of days ago. So we've done in basically two and a half, less than two and a half months, what we expected to do over the course of a year. A lot of that is down to the, the speech and also some other interviews that we, that I did after that, that we've put out. And also Francis, my co-host, he's been working hard as well, but the speech gave us a big impetus. Uh, so that's been awesome. My own audience has grown dramatically. Uh, I think several thousand people bought my book in addition to the ones that had bought it before, just off the back of the speech. Um, you know, uh, I've been invited to do all sorts of crazy things. Like I was invited to have lunch with Britain's most senior judges at the Old Bailey, which is the central criminal court of the UK the other day. Um, you know, I, I just get these one off. I wrote a sub stack about it, which I'm actually quite proud of. Uh, but you know, lots of other incredible one-off or recurring opportunities and people who are interested in having a conversation and sharing their thoughts with me. Uh, you know, one of the amazing things to me is that I regularly get to chat to like some of the, the people that I use interviews I used to watch. Well, now we just, we, we can chat on the phone for a few hours, uh, and talk about different things. You know, it's, it's an incredibly rewarding thing. It is true that as your profile grows, you know, I, I, I used to love Twitter so much because I, it's a platform I enjoy. I love communicating. I used to love going into all the comments and chatting with people and, you know, engaging with, you know, feedback and criticism, whatever. But as it gets bigger, you pick up so many hate followers that you have to like trudge through so much crap before you get to a person with whom you could actually have a 
actual conversation that's been actually quite a big loss to be honest to me like i so enjoy talking to people particularly people with whom i wouldn't normally get a chance to speak you know like we all operate in some kind of social circle and that's maybe 50 to 100 people or whatever but that's the amazing thing about social media is you can be communicating with hundreds of thousands of people at the time mm-hmm. the only problem is once you get to hundreds of thousands the law of large numbers comes in and you you get you know the, the statistical representation of society including you know the 15 percent of mentally ill people and, and and all the rest of it you know um and so that's it's it's been as you know it probably is completely insignificant in comparison to everything else but i do experience as that as a loss to be honest because i i used to so enjoy it you know communicating with those people but overall man it's it's been the response has been fantastic uh people have been very kind i have had a lot of opportunities off the back of it the youtube channel has grown my own substack has grown you know the 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 talks of people i get to hear from and speak with have just you know it, it's expanded and grown as well so it, it's been an incredible start to the year I, I couldn't be more pumped were you asked to write a speech on what you end up ended up speaking about the woke culture has gone too far or was that something that you wanted to speak on yourself so I actually didn't want to speak about it, which is why I ended up talking mostly about climate change. If you, if you remember the speech, right? Uh, because, uh, I'm, as I said in, in the speech itself, I'm very tired of talking about world culture. Yep. It's not something I really have anything that I feel like, Oh, I've got a gap to fill in my understanding of the system. Like I, I, you know, we, we spent five years looking pretty in depth at what was going on because that's really the genesis of trigonometry is trying to understand what the hell is happening uh in the culture and so i'm pretty clear on what i think about it now and i don't particularly want to have more conversations about why wokeness is stupid and wrong i just think it's time for us to start doing stuff that that we need to do to address that um but i was invited to be part of a debate at oxford union which is a very prestigious thing and they were like could you could you talk about why what culture has gone too far and i was like oh no oh, oh, oh. okay <laughs> then all right fine but as i tend not to write my speeches until literally like the day before or something you yeah. know because you, you need creative inspiration i feel and partly it's about like giving yourself several months to think about it you know as you're driving home from or whatever just to go okay you know and let it ruminate um and so the the week of and as it was coming to i started to formulate an idea in my head of what i wanted to say and i realized that woke culture is a dimension of it but really you know what i wanted to do was to speak to young people who may be leaning in that direction or whose natural habitat may be a work environment they they may never even thought about it like most people most young people aren't thinking about these issues i probably wasn't when i was young so but you you kind of grow up in the soup that you're surrounded by that you don't even question right soup of ideas and attitudes and stereotypes and so um i wanted to see if i could communicate with those people from a position of agreeing with them and going, this is how you see the world. Let me show you why even within that framework, what you're doing doesn't make sense. Mm. You know, and can I make that argument? And that to me has always been an exciting thing because, you know, this is part of the big debate that's happening in online space at the moment is like, what is the constructive way to approach many of these controversial issues? Do you smash people over the head with memes and trolling and, and whatever? Or do you try and bring people along and make it easier for people to go, you know what, maybe the people who are criticizing some elements of this ideology, they're not all bad, they're not all evil, they're not all whatever. Um, Maybe they've got a good point. And that's kind of how I approach this. So I was asked to speak about work culture, but that's a very long way of saying why I sort of didn't quite really talk about it. I talked about it for about 15 seconds at the beginning and 15 seconds at the end, really. Yeah. And then the rest of it was all on climate change, which yeah. I thought was really, really fascinating considering that climate change is a massive uh, topic of, of debate at the moment, whether or not we, we don't deny that climate change exists, but to the extent of which the conversation is had around it, it seems like we are being told one thing and then, being told another thing at the same time. So it's get, it gets really, really confusing. It's like, how do we navigate this kind of 
space properly and in a in a um, in a way that actually is making sense <laughs> to the right to the population. Well, the, the problem I have with the way that the, the, the we're talking about this issue as a society, I mean, not you and I, but it's like, you know, you go to the doctor and he goes, well, you know, you've got some serious problems with your legs. You go, okay, cool. So what do we do? And he goes, we need to chop your head off. Mm. You kind of go, well, first of all, that seems a bit extreme. And also that doesn't really make sense. How is that going to help my legs? And, and so the issue with the conversation about not so much climate change, because as you say, you know, neither of us is denying that it's an issue. The, 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 the conversation doesn't seem to have any solution to the problem, right? Mm. Like the, 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 the Almost all of the CO2 that we're going to be creating over the next many years, the increase in that is going to be coming from China and India. And yet we, we all, but it's like, you know, if, if I wash out my, you know, tuna tin that I'm saving the planet, it's not actually how it works, unfortunately. Right. So we have to come up with ways of making clean energy that is cheap enough that people in India and China who are desperately trying to industrialize a country are actually going to want to use it because it's cheap enough. I mean, I, I was having lunch with, uh, with a senior guy in India and he was telling me the stats. I mean, he's, it's amazing. So India became independent in 1947. Mm. Uh, do you, do you know what the average life expectancy in India was in 1947? Uh, 32 years old, man. You were never going to yeah. guess that. Yeah. 32 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know what it is now? 50 something 72 72 72. and that's because they're industrializing man that's because they're using energy to make their people more prosperous they are uh, electrifying the whole country they've got electricity to every village now um they are putting water into every small village and and bigger towns obviously right so they're trying to supply their people with water and energy now they need uh cleaner water than they've got at the moment that like that's a problem and that they're working on my point is like these aren't abstract things it's not like you can just like stop using energy and then everything stays the way it was no 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 we use energy to keep people alive and i think it behooves us to think about that instead of sitting in comfortable well-lit western houses and and going and well heated western houses by the way and going you know what we need to do is net zero that's not going to solve the problem and by the way it's not going to work democratically because as long as you live in a democracy once you put that pain on people in terms of the economics of it you're going to get you know a thousand bolsonaros elected because people are going to push back against it and this is by the way isn't my point it's um uh, uh, Jordan Peterson just had him on this brilliant guy talks about climate a lot. I can't believe I'm Bjorn Lomberg. Bjorn Lomberg. There we go. Yes. Uh, sorry, Bjorn. Uh, so that's a point that he made about, you know, the democratic impossibility of achieving these outcomes and the way that we're going about it. Right. So you gotta, we, if, and I say this, especially when people come after me and like, well, you're a climate change. I'm mm. not a climate change denier. I'm saying, even if we believe that climate change is the worst problem facing humanity right now, what you're doing and what you're suggesting doing makes no sense. Right. Can we talk about the way to actually solve the problem? Yeah. And for, for the Oxford audience, because I was speaking to young people, the point I was trying to make to them is like, you can do all the complaining and protesting and, you know, as Extinction Rebellion, these climate loons do in the UK, throw soup on paintings and glue themselves to roads and stop ambulances getting to hospitals and whatever. You can do all that. But you're not actually making anything better. No. You're just making yourself feel better. That's that's all you're doing, right? If you actually want to go and solve the things that you care about, whatever they are, I'm not telling you what you should care about. I'm not your dad, right? But if you want to achieve results in the world, sorry, there's only one way. This has only yeah. ever been one way. Learn, work hard, go and create and build things that change the world. It's the only way it's ever been done. It's the only way. You know, and even the tech, you know, even the the sort of social progress in in recent decades. Quite often, you find when you drill down to it, a lot of it's technological. I mean, people think you know, feminism liberated women. Feminism came along at a time when women are being rapidly liberated by technology. Right? Mm-hmm. The, the pill, domestic appliances, all these things that meant that women had to spend less time doing the stuff that they were forced to do because they couldn't control their reproductive system, right? Now, that had a lot of consequences, positive and negative. We can talk about that. But the point is, that's what was liberating women to a large extent, right? And 
So technology progress of that nature is really the number one thing that you should be aiming at if you want to make the world better. Make, make, make something, create something, solve the problem, right? If you think that, you know, plastic waste is a problem, go and invent some tiny little thing that reduces the plastic output of the world by 0.0001%. Yeah. Do that. And if you do that, you're going to make way more of a difference than every single person has ever spent their entire life whining and complaining, right? That That's what I was trying to say to them. And I think climate change is a good example of that because how contradictory the things we're being told are, as you said yourself. And I was talking to a very senior scientist recently, and he was saying to me, like, we keep lying about the climate. And I was like, whoa, 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 you're like a scientist. What do you mean we keep lying about the climate? And he was like, the climate is a problem, mm-hmm. but we keep lying about the way to solve it. And I don't know why that is. But that is where we are. We keep being lied to about the problem uh, of how to solve the problem, even even if we acknowledge that the problem is real. So uh, that's what I wanted to aim at. But look, I'm not a climate expert, obviously. I, I was just trying to use an example that these kids would understand because they're all supposed to be terrified about the climate. Yeah. It's like my big question is why are we being lied to about it in the first place? And yeah. if we are being lied about it, how can we know that we are, what is the actual truth? How can we search out the real facts and truth and not be beaten over the head by coming up with a different viewpoint to these other politicians that seem that it's all the Western country's fault for creating insurmountable so-called damage. But then you look at countries like where the majority of the the pollution is coming from, China and India, the moment you talk about that, you're considered a racist. And then... Yeah. Well, I mean, I I, I think I've I've never heard the link made quite that directly, but I know what you mean. Uh, And actually, you know, uh, we should be clear, by the way, that the West has... uh, a responsibility for the CO2 that's been emitted into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution, yeah. right? And because the Industrial Revolution started in Britain and spread out to the Anglosphere and elsewhere, of course, Western countries, I mean, rich countries are rich because they've burnt a lot of energy and have created and used a lot of technology. And the reason that China and India are rapidly becoming uh, the biggest sources of, of CO2 is they're trying to make their people comfortable and wealthy and survive longer and they don't want their children starving to death and so on. So I've got zero issue with China or India or anyone doing the things that they're doing. And I don't disagree that the West has a share of responsibility for the total CO2 output throughout history. Of course, all I'm saying is if you want to solve the problem, obsessing about evil Western people isn't going to solve that problem, right? So even if you believe all of that, it's still not going to solve the problem. The only problem you're solving is making yourself feel better. Uh, I don't know why we're being lied to exactly. I imagine as in all of these things, there's a huge amount of money to be made yeah. uh, in whichever direction our governments take our countries. Do you know? Do we spend money on this type of technology or that type of technology? Do we? And I, I suspect you know once a certain group of people have their hands on on those politicians and and they're able to whisper in their ear and you know the nuclear energy seems to not be getting any attention from anybody even though it's by far the most obvious solution to many of these issues right uh, and the invention of new technology in different areas that seems to me like something we should be working on but maybe if you are a very rich landowner who has a lot of windmills on his land Mm. Maybe you go, you know, come on, mate. You know, this is this is great. Uh, I I don't know. I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I'm just sort of hypothesizing out loud. So uh, don't quote me on that. But I, I I couldn't possibly say. All I can tell is, like things don't add up. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm with you there, man. Honestly, and and to be honest, like I'm not that well versed in the whole climate change. Yeah conversation myself i mean i'm still trying to figure it out i'm still trying to question a lot of things that are going on and i'm trying my best to listen to a lot of the people that are somewhat on both sides of of the spectrum because i feel like there is a a healthy uh space there to hold conversations with both both uh sides i think if we we basically close both sides down and just say look one side is 
is right and the other side is wrong, that's a dangerous rhetoric. And and that is what I think we've been seeing with the whole culture wars and, and cancel culture being at the forefront of everything. It's like, I'm right, you're wrong. And if I'm right and you're wrong, it, it, it comes with all these other uh, nasty connotations to it. You know what I mean? It, it's just, it's, I, I, I love healthy conversation. I love healthy debate. And I love being able to ask questions. And I guess one of the main questions that I have for you, Constantine, is like how in the world, like from your perspective, having looked at and had conversations with a lot of people, how in the world have we gotten here? Like have we made proper progress or have we regressed in some ways, you think? Hmm. Well, I suppose that depends on what you mean by progress, doesn't it? Because um, th- I think the big problem of our time is that we've got to a position where too many people have confused change with progress. Uh, progress to me, uh, and this is kind of why I'm neither a conservative nor nor a lefty, is progress to me is is extremely necessary. Yeah. On the one hand, but the reason I'm not a progressive is that I think we should be very careful about uh, diving headfirst into changes that we make. Uh, I think that society, you know, it's a it's a very fragile ecosystem. And when you start to mess with some of its founding blocks to the level that we are starting to, you can end up in some very dark places very quickly. And so when, when people say, you know, you know, conservatives, they want to keep everything the same. That's what it means, right? Keep, keep the good things about society. Uh, and progressives think, you know, change is important. And I'm like, well, both are important. We got to keep the good bits of our society that are working. Uh, and slowly and carefully look to improve the things that aren't working, right? Yeah. So to me, the you know, the, the racial progress we've made in the last 60, 70 years in the West, most kind of other countries, by the way, haven't made it to near th- nearly like the same degree. You won't hear that, but it's true. Um, that progress on racial relations, that's something that we should celebrate uh, and model the way that we did that right Mm -hmm. we should be looking at how did that happen how did we go you know from a society that 200 years ago uh owned slaves and uh you know australia has its own history and america obviously has its own history and britain has its own history and russia where i come from has its own equally dark history on all of these things Mm -hmm. how did we go from that uh, to to the present day uh, and to me the big po- the big answer is you know th- 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 this is pe- people don't understand the history of slavery at all uh the the reality of what happened is that the west uh culpability in, in all of that is tremendous and huge and terrible uh but it is exactly the same as the history of slavery of every other great civilization in human history the only thing that makes the west's history of slavery and particularly this was led by britain um remarkable in any way i mean partly it was about the technological era which allowed you know transatlantic transportation of large groups of people and whatever but the main difference between britain having slaves like every other country in in history and britain not having slaves is that britain and the west are the first group of people that said wait a minute maybe slavery is wrong yeah nobody else thought that before no other civilization just went, you know what? Shall we, shall we, uh, completely remodel the entire economic basis of our system? How we build our temples, how we build huge things that we aim to do, right? Mm. Uh, and stop, stop using slavery, which they were all doing up until that point to actually go, you know what? This is not in our economic self interest, but as a moral issue, because we have a version of liberalism here in the West that says, an individual matters. You as an individual, because you're a human being, you matter. Doesn't matter what your race are. Even in those days when people thought that people of some races are not inferior to them. Even then, this idea that we're all have dignity and value because we're individuals was so powerful 
that had forced this great civilization to actually change the course of its own history and with it drag everybody else along. Mm -hmm. That is remarkable, right? It's absolutely remarkable. And that is a product of the way that we we do business in the West. You know, it's a product of the way that we view the world. Uh, you know, liberalism has become a, a very dirty word of late. And there, because it means all sorts of different things to all sorts of different people. But at the core of it, you know, actually, uh, Jordan Peterson, not in, in, we talked about him before. Uh, uh, I, we were once at a dinner together and somebody, I asked him, what, what, what is Western civilization? What mm -hmm. does that mean? And he gave a long and winding answer. And then our host said to me, well, what do you think about when I say Western civilization? And I gave a m much less eloquent and much more brief answer than Jordan. But to me, it's that. It's the idea of the the the, the individual has value and sovereignty. Like, I know I, I'm banging on a bit, but it's just some, something that's so important because I'm reading um, this Russian philosopher called Alexander Dugin, mm -hmm. uh, who they call him Putin's brain. Uh, this is a guy who's responsible for a lot of the sort of ideological underpinnings of what Putin is doing and the geopolitical visions of his. Um, and he says, he says, you know, we need to reshape the Russian nation so that every person thinks of themselves first as a Russian, then as a Orthodox Christian, and only afterwards as a person. Oh, wow. All right. People in the rest of the world think collectively to a large extent. Yeah. And your dignity and rights as an individual, they don't matter. Putin doesn't matter sending three, four, five hundred thousand young men to die in Ukraine for a piece of land. He doesn't care. Right. Because in the grand scheme of things, that's worth it to him. Yeah. And in the, in that system, he's willing to do that. And those people are willing to sacrifice themselves for that. They're not going there, you know, singing the, the national anthem. They're not delighted, but they'll go if they're told. Right. Mm. Um, and we have a very different system in the West where we say, no, 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 no. That tiny piece of land is not worth 500,000 people's lives. It's just not right. Uh, we're not going to send our boys to do that because they have value. They have meaning. Now, of course, we'll go and fight if we have to. That's a different thing. Uh, but this is the difference between the West and everywhere else. And I've been talking for so long, I've forgotten how we got to this question. No, it was it was a quite a broad question to begin with. It's like how in the world did we get here in the first place? So I loved your answer because there are a lot of little things that sort of compounded into this one big thing which landed us in this current space. Mm. There's a lot of actual issues going on in society. Well, I see them as a lot of issues, and I think you see them as issues too. I think Jordan Peterson sees them as issues as I've heard him talk about many of them. And I agree with a lot of the things that he has to say regarding a lot of the issues that we are no doubt seeing. And I've also heard him talk about solutions, but it's like there's a lot of people that don't agree with those kinds of solutions. So it's like, well, okay, if you don't agree with those solutions, can you come up with something better? <laughs> mm. And and that's the big, big topic of, of debate at the moment because it's like, well, is democracy under attack? Is Do you foresee democracy remaining strong in the near future with all these issues that seeming look like it is not democratic at all, in my opinion? Like what? What, do you, what are you talking about? Like looking about the whole COVID pandemic, for mm. example. I don't know yeah. what it was like for you in, in uh, Britain, but here in Australia, we had severe severe lockdowns yeah now, i understand the whole argument of it was a it was a pandemic people would get sick but the, it's evident now that the way it was handled handled especially in democratic western societies it just wasn't well handled we at all the bed we shot yeah. the bed 100 it's a great way we to the bed. describe it right however uh, I would simultaneously, in agreeing with you on that, uh, challenge you and say, you say it's undemocratic. I don't know. I think it's much worse than that. I think it's democratic. Uh -huh. I think so what we found out during COVID is that 65 to 70% of people in a country, when there's a big fear and a big scare, mm -hmm. they're going to shed the bed. 
And and if you say and if you if they're terrified and they're they're scared and they're sitting there shaking, quaking in their boots, and someone comes along and says, Hey, listen, we, we can't promise you, but there is a chance that if we, I don't know, start cutting everyone's fourth toe off, we might reduce the chances of this pandemic spreading. Mm. So there are some people who are gonna go, well, look, you know, I mean, cutting people's toes off is is not great, but if it's going to make us all safer, maybe we should give it a go. Now, obviously, I'm joking and exaggerating, but yeah, people got scared uh, and they were prepared to do things that, in my, in my opinion, in a liberal society, you you never should do. You know, having quarantine camps and fucking whatever it was, right, that we saw in Australia mandatory vaccinations that they attempted to force on doctors and and nurses in this country just com- i mean that never made any sense to me no you've got a bunch of people who are not medical experts by definition because they're politicians forcing people who are medical experts by definition because they're doctors and nurses to have an injection that those people don't want to take what yeah so that, that stripping the humanity aspect. It's like you're that not doesn't human. make any sense to me. That does not make any sense to me, right? And uh, that's nothing to do with how safe or effective I think the vaccine is or whatever. Like I, I, I said throughout COVID, you know, if I were elderly or I was in a risk group, I would take that vaccine, a hundred percent. But if I'm young and healthy, I want the freedom not to. Yeah. Particularly because we know that it doesn't really stop transmission, right? It's it's a very simple point. And so I agree with you. The fact that the government uh, forced things on the public that, in my opinion, never should have even been considered, yeah. let alone implemented, uh, was illiberal. But I also am very sad to say I do think it was democratic, at least in the sense that it was representative of the wishes of the majority of our fellow citizens who actually were very happy. They were very happy to tell other people what to do. They were very happy to feel, to, to dob in their neighbor who didn't do this or who went out twice instead of once. There were a lot of people who really, really quite enjoyed that. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, that's the society we live in, man. I, I'm sorry if that sounds, you know, uh, gripey and sad and, you know, whatever, but, uh, I am, that was shocking to me. It really opened my eyes and I was very disappointed with what I saw. It's a scary, scary thought to think that if they can do that during a pandemic, it's scary to think what they can do now because they know of how complicit the society and the population actually is to follow along with these politicians and their, yeah. and their will and, and all the information that is coming out at the moment goes against a lot of the information that they were pushing during the whole pandemic. And it's just crazy like how how much information has changed in the space of not even two years. So right. it's like and you look and at it's it's mean. not that it's just it's just changed. I mean, Jay, sorry to interrupt. It's not that like, for example, you know, no one ever said they said, you know, this virus came from a bat. Mm. Right. And then two years later, someone went, actually, you know what? Maybe it came from a lab in China, right? It wasn't like that. What actually happened was at the time, lots of people said, we think this came from a lab in China. Yeah. And they all got censored. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, we're like, hmm, maybe it came from a lab in China. You got to be careful, and, Constantine. You're now a racist for saying that. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think I am a racist for saying that. I, I think we should look the 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 facts of this in the face, man. Because, yeah. um, you know, and and that's just one example. There are other examples. There were Nobel winning scientists who mm. were being censored for expressing opinions in their own field, which is unbelievable. In their right? own like- field. <laughs> They're the most qualified to talk about this issue, and right. yet they're being censored. It's just exactly why. <laughs> well, exactly, and and by the way, I am not one of these people who thinks that there's this big giant conspiracy and a cabal of pedo lizards headed by Klaus Schwab is is what you know taking over the world. 
I, I just think that, you know, the incentive, I, I always, I'm a big believer that fundamentally the thing that drives all human behavior is incentives. Yeah. People respond to incentives, right? Yeah. And if you have a system in which if you are the prime minister of Australia and I'm the prime minister of Britain, every single death in your country is from COVID is your responsibility. And every single death that happens five years later from an untreated cancer caused by lockdown is not treated as your responsibility. And it's the same for me in the UK and it's the same for everybody everywhere. Right. If every death from COVID is on your conscience and no other deaths you are responsible for, if you optimize for COVID deaths as a politician, you're going to do whatever you think is going to do, you need to do to reduce COVID deaths. And you're going to ignore the tremendous amount of collateral damage that occurs from the things you're trying to do to reduce COVID. Right. So it, it's, it's not a conspiracy. It's just, it's, it's the, the flaw in the system. Mm. Uh, and it's it's because people, you know, it, it's hard to tell if if you're 75 years old and you're genuinely at risk of COVID. Yeah. You know, are you in are you in the right mental frame? Let's put it that way. In that moment, to think about the long term consequences for the country. And for the next generation and for kids who are, whose schooling is going to be interrupted. Or are you just thinking, I don't want to die? Yeah. Right. And when you take a lot of people who don't want to die, they are going to demand policies of the government that make them feel like that's going to, you know, d delay the, the, the issue, <laughs> to put yeah. it mildly. Right. Um, so I think that's where we were, man. It's just the incentive structure was perverse and in perverse incentive structures get you perverse results when you said club Schwab or whatever his name is and, and the lizard people and the great cabal I, I don't know if you know this this show on netflix inside job no oh it's great <laughs> they make the joke yeah. of that there is this secret society within the government and then the lizard people actually control like a lot of people a lot of politicians a lot of celebrities are actually secretly lizard people it's, a, it's such a right. clever show, man. Honestly, I think you'll I think you'll enjoy it. It's quite witty. Yeah. And they, they well, the lizard the pedo lizard thing is a well known trope because I think way back when a guy called David Icke uh, yeah. went on TV in Britain and he talked about how the world's run by by lizards or something. So it's it's a it's a well known thing. It's been like uh, it's a common like cultural reference. I think now the the lizard thing. I don't think I saw that thing but i, I just you're, you're too that, young i imagine I, I probably was a bit too young but uh yeah i i saw the the show inside job and i was just laughing my head off because a lot of it is just it's just so funny <laughs> they just rip on a lot of the conspiracy theories and and they make it actually true <laughs> it's perfect but i wanted to go back a little bit before we go forward if that's okay with you constantine i wanted yeah. to ask you about so this whole idea of progression moving forward this this idea that we are moving forward in a particular way uh and you also mentioned distinguishing between change versus progression and i wanted yeah. to ask you how do we know that it is great progression that this idea is a good thing for society versus mm. this is just change and this change is not going to be good at all is there a way to distinguish the two well, it's difficult, obviously, but I think, um, I mean, there are some fairly obvious ways you measure that, you know, human happiness, uh, life expectancy, economy, you know, all sorts of this, the things that make up the human experience. Uh, but fundamentally, I mean, one of the things that, um, you have to look at is all new technology is also disruptive, right? So if we're talking about human flourishing, for example, would you argue that social media has increased human flourishing and human happiness? I argue that it would. Yeah. I argue that I would argue that it, it did rather, but that it's also created a lot of misery too. 
Yeah. Right. So these are trade offs. And that's something that we're going to have to keep working out is as these breakthrough technologies, you can't control change most of the time, because as we talked about before, it's technological. Like once some guy somewhere invents a nuclear bomb, eventually everyone's going to have a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. Right. And that creates problems with which you now have to deal in some kind of way. And it's the same for the pill. It's the same for the Internet. It's the same for social media. They create things and it's about how do we respond? And I think in, in this instance, you have to look at, you know, what's the positive impact? Well, the positive impact is you and I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't social media. We wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, people wouldn't be watching and listening. Uh, this, we wouldn't be having this great time on the yeah. one hand. On the other hand, you know, social media, uh, the impact it has on young people in particular, uh, the impact it has on vulnerable people, whether they're vulnerable for mental health reasons or whatever, Right. The, you know, it, there are things that can happen on the Internet that are bad. Uh, the way it affects people's minds, we still haven't fully, fully understood. Right. But for example, I am certainly like I, I have a 10 month old son. Like there is no way that he's getting the phone until he's 16, like a smartphone. It's not going to happen. Right. No discussion. Hashtag no debate. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, because it's very clear. The evidence is very, very clear. It's, it's not good for them. Mm. You know, so we are still trying to work out how, how do you manage that technology? And I think eventually you're probably going to get to a position where there are certain types of technology that, you know, go behind an age wall, just like cigarettes and alcohol and whatever, because they're that harmful, or at least that will happen in pockets of society. There'll be, there'll be whole, you know, areas of, of Britain and Australia where people only give their kids like a, a phone that has, you know, Google Maps and, and, you know, messaging and phone calling or whatever, but that's about it. Um, and so, yeah, the, we, you, you got to look at what's happening, what, what impact the technology is making and then go, how do we deal with this societally? I heard that there was a report the other day. Uh, I don't know how long ago it actually was that they looked at the effects that technology has on the literacy and numeracy skills of young kids. Mm -hmm. And they said that the ages, I think it was between, if you give a kid an iPad at the age of five upwards, their literacy and numeracy skills today at the age of 11 or 12 has been significantly reduced. So they're now mm. not able to comprehend as much as what I was able to do in school, being able to just handwrite everything. And handwriting mm. sucked, but <laughs> it was beneficial to my learning capacity. So... In that instance, yes, technology is good in one way, but then the old way can be better suited for a lot of, a lot of people in terms of helping with the literacy and numeracy skills moving forward in life. So I don't think you should remove that entirely. I think you should incorporate technology in such a way that it actually helps inform the child, not just allowing the child to be on their device. 24 seven, which is what a lot of parents are doing, unfortunately, which is contributing to the epidemic of loneliness and social skills and you name it. So it's the fascinating dynamic, I think. It is. Uh, and out. you actually illustrate a very interesting point, which is what they call Chesterton's fence, mm. uh, which is the idea that there's a, there's a fence in the, in the middle of a field. Uh, and a guy comes along and goes, well, there's, there's a fence in the middle of the field. What, why would you need that? And if you are the person asking that question, you're the least qualified person to make that decision. <laughs> because if you don't know why the fence is there, you should definitely not be removing it, right? Yeah. Uh, and you, this is kind of what, what we're talking about with change versus progress is like, yes, technology adapts, but you often find that when you change something, you only then later learn why it was there in the first place. Yeah. Like, like with the relationship, you know, you were with someone and then, and then you split up and then you go, oh, you know, this is what I'm missing now. Like, this is what I didn't realize that she did that. Or I didn't, you know, there's certain things that come through where you go, okay. Uh, people, especially with, with people find that when, when they lose a loved one, you know, it's like the, oh, he used to do this or he used to do that. And they don't even, we don't even realize, right? So it's important not to be killing off people <laughs> without first making sure that they really deserve it, I guess is what I'm saying. What's the the number one issue that you're most concerned about at the moment? 
or most interested in? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, well, I was thinking, I, I've got like different ones in front of me, but I think they all tie into the same thing, which is whatever angle you approach it from, whether it's the war in Ukraine or whether it's woke culture or whether it's the economic situation in many Western countries. Fundamentally, the issue that concerns me is, I mean, it seems to me that there is a possibility. It's just a possibility. I'm not saying this is how it will go down, but this could be this next decade, the next 10 years, maybe even the next seven years, could be where the future of the West is decided for a much longer period of time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the West plus the Soviet Union won World War II, and that set the path of the world for about 70 years. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that one incident, really. I mean, it wasn't an incident. It was a, it was a four year war. Uh, or the World War II was a longer even than that. I'm, I'm still thinking like a Russian six year war. Um, because in the Soviet Union, we call it the Great Patriotic War, and, and it only started in 1941. That's why I said four years. Anyway, so um, that how that worked out, how that big geopolitical drama, if you abstract it at that level, forget, you know, human tragedy, obviously. It's hugely important as well. But at the geopolitical level, that shapes the world for the next 70 years, basically, right? And it is only maybe with the fall of the Soviet Union – and then the next 20 years as that part of the world sort of reshapes itself, that the world enters a new phase, right? In my opinion, the next seven to 10 years, you're going to see something like that happen again. Like all of these bubbling crises of various kinds, um, the, the war in Ukraine, the tension with China over Taiwan, uh, the economic you know, are we ever going to put our economic system in the West on a sound footing or are we just going to continue to print money yeah. forever? You know, all of these things, you know, is NATO a real alliance or, <laughs> or is it just going to crumble at the first sign of danger? Well, that to a large extent has been answered actually. And, and it answers positive. It's, it's, it, NATO's prepared, uh, to stand up for itself if it needs to. Um, and that, so you, you put all those things together, all of these questions, are, you know, Vladimir Putin is almost certainly either going to die or at least be not in power in Russia within the next 10 years. I don't imagine he's going to cling on for life. If, and he's a very healthy old guy uh, for a guy his age. But, uh, you know, I don't imagine he's still going to be president of Russia in 10 years time. So all of these massive changes are going to happen. And... This is the thing that concerns me is, you know, does does the West, if I say, does the West survive, that sounds overly dramatic. Of course, the West survives, uh, you know, the West survives in some shape or form. But does the West retain its cultural, economic, military dominance? And people go, well, who cares? It's just, you know, we don't, we don't want it. Well, it's, it's, the world's a bit more complicated than that. And the moment you are not in charge, someone else is. And then you're singing to their, you're dancing to their tune and then you're doing wh whatever the metaphor is, right? You're, you're following their orders uh, and you don't want to be doing that. That's why China and Russia are doing what they're doing. They they don't want to be taking orders from others. So that's really the thing that concerns me from, from all of these different angles, you know. It's like you, you look at the current leadership at the moment in Russia and in China. And I mean, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping announced that he was uh, president for life or something like that. Not long no, ago. no, come on. Let's no, no. Let's not be unfair. He got re-elected for a third term ah, yes, uh, by yes, two thousand nine hundred and fifty-two <laughs> votes to zero. That's a long way away for yeah. another election. Yeah, <laughs> there's something to it to be uh, excited about. But yeah, it's like, are we going to replace the bad for the worse, like, or are we going to replace the bad for the good? Or I was looking at the news the other day, which is something I never do and I hardly do. Um, and people here in Australia, these so so-called experts were talking about how we should be getting ready for war in three years time because mm. war with China is just around the corner. And I'm like, well, that's a positive 
thought, isn't it? <laughs> like World War Three with, with yeah. China. What's that going to look like? They've got nukes. They didn't really have nukes. Well, they did. They used two of them, unfortunately. And look what happened with that. Like it's, it's scary. <sighs> It's scary. Wait, has China used nuclear weapons? No, no. It like World War Three would be a a nuclear war. Yeah, no, it would be. But you said they have used nukes. Oh no, no. So um, even the Americans two two nukes in in World War Two. Sorry, I should have clarified that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought yeah. you were talking about the Chinese, and I was like, whoa. No, that, that's a part something. of history that I, I yeah. <laughs> don't want to yeah. state any. Uh, uh, yeah, don't don't listen to that <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. sort of things. But yeah, I just misheard you. Yeah, it's a uh, for me looking at all the issues that are somehow compounding a lot. It's going to get worse before it gets better. They're saying, and it's like, okay, is the the icing on the cake, as it were? We go to war, and then what? Does it You're asking sense? me. Yeah, I'm asking. What the hell do I know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Just... <laughs> I, know I, I can't predict whether World War Three is going to happen, man. But um, I'm just saying I think this is a pivotal piv- period in which a lot of shifts, not changes, but shifts are going to happen that then set the, the rails for the next, you know, long chunk of time. Yeah. Uh, along which we'll be traveling. So, you know, the period between World War II and 1990s obviously defined by the Cold War, right? That that's the and and the and everything else that happens in in the world to a very large extent is affected by that. You know, countries in Africa have civil wars and and all kinds of things because of the Cold War. Latin America is a complete chaos because of the Cold War. Uh Af- Afghanistan gets invaded you know, because of the Cold War, Vietnam, the war in Korea, these are all things that happen outside of either the Soviet Union or America, but they are because of the Cold War, right? Um, and so I'm, that was something that was kind of set on a set of tracks. And I think uh, we are about to find out what the next next chunk of time is going to look like. Very interesting times indeed, my friend, and I'm glad that we are having these conversations and hopefully we can have more of them as the time progresses. And, you know, I think with all the issues, there are definitely solutions out there. And I think with smart people like yourself talking about them, then we can help move the solutions along. And um, hopefully people actually listen <laughs> and, and do something about it. But uh, to sort of wrap up this conversation in a nice little bow, I wanted to ask about your your show, Trigonometry. Now, I've been mm. following for quite some time and I've loved the conversations you've had on there. Uh, why did you decide in the first place to start a show called Trigonometry? Well, uh, we kind of touched on it already. Uh, Francis and I, we were two... Uh, comedians operating in, in, on the British stand-up scene. Uh, and uh, we saw that the scene kind of like change before our eyes. So in the early noughties, stand-up in Britain was full of, you know, the, the, the popular people at the time were people like Jimmy Carr and Frankie Boyle, two comedians who told gross outrageous extremely offensive jokes about all sorts of things and because of those two in particular but particularly frankie boyle in the mid in the early to mid noughties in the uk like if you were a stand-up comedian on the circuit and you didn't have at least two rape jokes in your set like you weren't you weren't even a comedian man like that's how it was um and I'm not saying I have, I'm desperate to go back to, to that period of time necessarily. But what happened is we went from that to like completely the other extreme in like three years. Yeah. Like suddenly, suddenly we went from that to everyone is talking about their fucking mental health and everyone is talking about their race all of a sudden, you know, but, but not the way you used to, you know, comedians, particularly minority comedians would always, 
you know, talk about that when they were talking to a largely uh, white audience. You ha- you kind of have to really. I, I I know this myself as like an immigrant in Russia. You kind of have to go into that uh, a little bit. But I mean, like white people would be like, "Oh, I'm a white guy," so blah blah blah, and. and it was always bad being white. Like again, people used to have routines about, well, as a white guy, this happens and that happens. That, that was fine. But it started to be from like this weird apologetic position. You know, you started people, uh, you know, people would be promoting gigs, asking for comedians and it'd be go, yeah, we, 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 we've too many men. So we need, you know, only this or not too many white people. So only, and it was kind of like, you know, it was starting to mess with what I actually thought was a pretty good idea, which is people should be promoted based on merit. Mm. Um, and it wasn't that particularly in itself because I, I never felt constrained, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, my progress within the comedy industry, uh, until I started writing for TV. And then it became very clear that I was never going to be on TV, uh, in the UK, like if I, you know, created my own audience online, then that, that, that would be fine. But I was never going to be on TV because I had the wrong opinions. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. and so I could write for other people, uh, but, but not, not express my own views, if you like. You see what I mean? Um, and, uh, I never complain about it because I still had a great comedy career, but it was just like, it was this weird shift and we were just trying to work out what happened basically. Mm. And plus, as I say, you know, if your professional opportunities are, um, going to be easier in a thing that you love doing, well, why wouldn't you do that? Like, why would I, even now, I mean, I, Francis has gone back to doing stand up. I enjoy what I do now a lot more. I, that's why I don't do stand up anymore because this is, I, I much, I much prefer, uh, doing what I do at the moment, you know, having conversations with people and the, the comedic side of it, you know, we do three raw shows a night, uh, which are like, uh, satirical and comedic live streams where we do every outrageous accent under the sun to make the most offensive jokes that we want. I love that, man. I would, I wouldn't, I don't want to drive around the country three hours here, three hours back to do 20 minutes in front of, you know, 200 people. I can be on the internet and, you know, 20,000 people are going to watch a show mm. uh, that I get to sit next to my friend and, and just chat shit for an hour and a half. Why, why wouldn't I do that? It's so much better. You both are really good at it. I got to admit. And I love the, the chemistry that you both possess during the conversations that you have, even if it's just you two or even yeah. with a guest. I personally love listening to you both talk to a guest because that's just my yeah. interest level. Yeah. But I also at, at times do enjoy you two just having a, a, a go. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're yeah. different. They're different shows entirely. Some people yeah. only watch raw. Some people only watch the interviews. Some people watch both. Um, and, uh, like the raw is a very, it's a strong flavor for sure. It, it is it's not yeah. for everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's was this not for everybody when you started trigonometry? Was this before or during your 2018 blow up? Uh, we started trigonometry in April 2018. Yeah. Uh, and we're plodding along slowly. And then that contract thing happened and that gave us a big boost. So, what actually yeah. happened with, with that whole university thing, real quick? Uh, they, uh, they saw me performing, uh, stand up. They really liked me. They invited me to help them raise money for charity. And they said, we need you to sign this contract if you want to perform. And the contract said that they had a zero, zero tolerance policy on racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-religion. And it also said that all jokes must be respectful and kind. Right. And so when I turned it down, I tweeted about it and it just went super viral, became a massive story covered in Australia, covered in America. I did Tucker, uh, you know, all sorts of crazy things going on. Um, and that was a, yeah, that was a big boost to, to our profile and to my profile. And it helped us along the way for sure. Maybe I should go to university and reject something. It seems to be a trend <laughs> happening with people rejecting university things that seem to go viral these days. George. Yeah. Well, you've got to find your own thing, man. Cause you, you yeah. can't be a, a, a fifth best someone else. Like you've got to find your own uh, way of doing it. Oh, um, yeah. So I mean, do I. 
Honestly, man, I think what you're doing is is great. I, I applaud you and Francis for all the work that you're doing. I've Thank you, my honestly friend. Honestly, love this it. conversation, really. Uh, I've got one final question for you, if that's all right with you. Yeah, go for it. We didn't really get too much into the nitty gritty of your actual story. Maybe that's a conversation for another time. But I wanted to ask you, what do you love the most about yourself and your story? Mm, that's a great question. Um, it's a great question. I mean, if people want to read my full story, they can read my book, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. And I talk a lot about stuff in that. Um, hmm. You know, My family and me, myself, like I've experienced a lot of difficult things in life, you know, um, and, and there are people, and I, and I'm truly blessed by the way, mm -hmm. you know, there are people who've lost parents and children and spouses and also like, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the world's biggest victim at all, but I've experienced difficult things in my life and my family you know, I grew up with my grandmother around who's in Ukraine right now, 96 years old. She lived through the Holodomor, which was a forced starvation of 7 million people in Ukraine. Um, the Nazi occupation, Stalin's repressions, uh, the, the, the later years of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the crazy 90s. Um, and she's sitting there right now with Russian troops 200 kilometers away, right? That's her life story. And everywhere I look at, at my family's history, it is full of things, you know, being sent to the gulag for saying the wrong thing, you know, people starving to death, all sorts of awful life events, just huge tragedy. Um, but you know, the, all of all of that, uh, you know, it it weighs on my mind sometimes. And people, I think, sometimes think I'm too serious or whatever. But it, it's because of I think coming from that sort of background. On the one hand, on the other hand, I also feel like I've been able to take all of that as inspiration for a more positive uh, way of being in the world, rather than thinking, you know, the world is tragic and bad things happen, and you know. That's, that's life. Uh, I've been lucky, you know, to, to live in a society where bad things don't generally happen. They happen to everybody, of course, but, but not in the same way. You know, no, nobody in Britain has been in a gulag and nobody in Britain within living memory has been occupied first by Hitler and now by Putin. It's not happened to anyone in Britain. You know what I mean? Nor in Australia. Uh, no, there wasn't a period of time within living memory when, you know, tens of thousands of people were starving to death, right? Or millions of people were starving to death. So I'm privileged to live in a place where we're relatively insulated by that. And I've been able to take the lessons and the memories of my family and use them as a way to remind myself and hopefully other people that we're very lucky. It's not that the world is terrible and tragic and, and, and whatever. It is. Well, we are very lucky and we should not take that for granted. You're not a victim, man. Mm. And that's good to hear. It really is. Yeah. Um, Constantine, thank you so much for your time today, man. Your wisdom, your advice, your stories, and really for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for having me, Jay.